morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're here today to talk about how local governments creatively use Agile to accomplish big missions. And we've got four fantastic panelists today. Um, we're going to start with some um, actually introductions and then some short presentations and then a roundtable discussion. And we welcome everyone to be asking questions. You can do that in the chat. We'd love to hear your questions. Um, and we'll go from there. So to start, I'm Elizabeth Raley. I am a member of Agile Gov Leaders. And um, I might be doing some moderating today. I may also be joined by Melinda, who uh, may moderate us. And I'm going to pass it over to Anna Whipple, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Anna Whipple. I'm the CIO for the city of Des Moines, Iowa. Previously, I was the GIS manager. And part of the story that we're going to tell today is how we've used Agile in the GIS team. Great. Welcome. Aaron, over to you. Hi, I'm Aaron Greiner. I am now the GIS manager for the city of Des Moines after Anna. And um, I'll we'll tag team with Anna. We'll talk a little bit about Agile with uh, GIS in Des Moines. Thank you. And Cameron. Hi, I'm Cameron Karimi. I'm the IT division manager for enterprise applications and data services at the city of Austin. Welcome. And Amy. Hello, my name is Amy Rose. I'm with the city of Dallas and I'm a senior GIS analyst. Excellent. Well, welcome to all of you. Why don't we start now with Anna's presentation? Okay, let me share my screen here. Okay, how does that look? Perfect. Great. Well, as you probably remember from your third grade geography, Des Moines is the capital of Iowa. We have a, a council manager form of government. Our IT department serves 15 city departments. And in a recent IT strategic plan and assessment, we found that our IT department is about half the size of the IT departments for similar cities. That's in terms of staff and budget. So we do consider ourselves scrappy and that's why this is a, a perfect topic for us. The story that I'm going to begin telling here and then hand off to Aaron starts in 2015 when our GIS team initiated Agile. So what the situation was, um, I think we had to take an honest look at what our team environment was before we even started to attempt agile methods. And what we had was in 2008, the city completely rebuilt its GIS function. We hired all new GIS team members, very skilled people coming from outside the organization. And in that situation, we sort of took a divide and conquer approach. So certain staff got familiar with certain departments and their applications and took over responsibility for their GIS needs. But that led to sort of silos of knowledge even within our small team. And everybody had basically their own backlog that they were working from. It wasn't always transparent what was on people's backlogs. We did collaborate, but that I would call that commitment to collaboration loose or not really intentional. Uh, we didn't necessarily try to merge backlogs and, and work together on projects. And that made it difficult to sustain our focus day to day, week to week. We kept getting interrupted with other work coming in from departments. And as happens with teams, in that situation, sometimes our level of trust was high, sometimes low. The environment at the time, like I said, we completely rebuilt GIS for the city. And by the time we got to 2015, we had gained a lot of momentum, uh, really reached out to the departments needing our services. And so they were demanding more. 
from GIS. They understood what it was about and wanted more of our services. So we're in a situation of having to not just build things once, but to continuously add value to the applications that we were producing. Our organization is fairly decentralized. It was more so in 2015 than today. We don't necessarily have like a centralized uh, project management office where we kind of do master planning. I would characterize the city as being pretty traditional in its structure and can seem bureaucratic at times. That has led to not only silos across departments, but I think taking an honest look at our responsibilities, even within our small team, we needed to break down silos and that included management responsibilities. We have limited funding for training and we also knew that there were retirements on the horizon. So we needed to be thinking about succession planning. That's kind of the state of things when we started on our, our agile path. So I became interested in this, um, kind of framed up just a few questions that I wanted answered. What is agile? Can it work in a small local government team? And can we do it at a low cost? So we took a very pragmatic approach, uh, kind of tested the waters and a few tools at a time to see if we could make this fit. And one of those uh, bits of research that I did was to get in contact with Kristen Runyon. She's an author of a couple agile books and we were fortunate that at the time she was working in Des Moines. So even before she published her book, she came and spoke with us and offered some insight into some very simple agile tools that can be used in development environments or completely different work that's not development related. So I started to look at these as the starter kit. I won't go into detail about what each of these is, but we kind of took this set of tools to start with. Creating a team working agreement developing user stories, creating a definition of done, having a progress board to make the work visible, having stand-up meetings for regular quick check-ins on progress, and using techniques like Fist of Five to gauge consensus. We didn't apply all of these right away. Some of them we've used and some of them we haven't, but it just gave us a tool set to begin with. And to briefly touch on one of those questions about cost, I had been first hearing about agile transformation in some of the large corporations in Des Moines, and they were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. I didn't, I knew we didn't have that, so could we do it for a, a minimal amount? And over about three years, we spent roughly $600 per team member that included um, local conferences and training. And then we reused furniture and really created a collaboration space based on what we had. And it, it totaled to a very nominal amount over the course of three years. So at this point, I will hand it over to Aaron and he can tell you more about where this evolved and where we are today. Aaron, I just stopped sharing my screen. All right, thanks, Anna. Yeah, so as Anna kind of outlined, uh, we had a, um, an interesting start and we had needs to kind of figure out some new solutions and it provided us kind of tools that we could use. And what we found is when we were short staffed, we, we needed to, um, to kind of figure out a way to manage expectations and our tasks and our, our priorities. And so what, what we did is we've kind of had three kind of big benefits that I can see right off the top. And we were able to do um, time and, and project management better. Um, we could use the tools and, and we allowed for better transparency then with in our groups and our departments and the customers we have. So we could actually say to them, we, we see what your project is, we work on the tasks and we know it's kind of a timeline when we can get to it and how we can work on it. 
Um, so it's, we're more efficient and uh, we can actually deal with the demand that um, our customers have for us. And um, it, it's kind of, as Anna sort of alluded to, we're somewhat victims of our own success. So as people got used to what we do and the tools we provided, they wanted them more and more. And so we're working on how we can actually kind of continue to provide the services and the levels that they expect, but keep up with everything that we've done in the past too. So I've got some slides kind of showing the evolution of our, our scrum board. And as Anna mentioned, it was cheap and low budget. So when we started out, we essentially had a large post-it note with little post-it notes on it. And we um, played around with learning how it would work for our group and how we kind of define tasks and do things. And then the second slide on the right you see is kind of a, a little bit further on evolution of it, just to give you an example of what some things we tried. And uh, in this example, you can see it's changed. We have um, a larger number of smaller tasks and we started color coding things based on the project we were working on. And what we quickly found was that there was a lot of clutter going on and a lot of um, work happening that didn't necessarily benefit us in kind of understanding the sprint board and what we were doing from day to day. So this last slide shows a more current example of where we are now. And what you can see is we, we evolved it into a uh, a cleaner board. We decided to do away with all the colors for different tasks and different projects. And instead we, we standardized on one yellow post-it uh, color. The idea there being, we don't really care what the project is. Um, we just need to know that there are tasks involved. And then you can see there's some other colors. There's a purple and there's a blue and they represent um, like what we call a meteor. Uh, one of our colleagues came up with that term for things that come in and really interrupt our work. We're not a true development shop. So for us, um, we have tasks that have to do with our day-to-day -day workload. Uh, and we get a lot of interruptions from outside sources, such as uh, city manager or city council, when there's a, a, a request that we need to fulfill right away. And so those show up as a purple note. And what that does is at the end of the sprint, it really allows us to see how we maybe dealt with or how our, our sprint was affected by um, outside unexpected things. Uh, some other things we did too, is we, we added a two and a four week sprint planning section. So as we get requests um, in the middle of a sprint, we can say to our customer, well, we know we don't have time to, to get to this right now. We're, we're already scheduled out, but I could put you on two or four weeks out depending on the priority for what you need. And we can work with them and help them um, kind of meet their need, but still work within our schedule and our plan. So it's been uh, pretty handy and having that board up helps really with transparency among our group and what we're all doing with our daily standups. And then with our customers as they can, they can come in and see it and actually understand where we are, and what we're doing. Um, some struggles with it that people always ask about, you know, is what, what, what are the problems? What do you guys work on? What, are, what were the issues when you started it? We were doing it. A big one is culture change and buy-in. You know, it's, it's difficult. Change is hard. Everybody's a little bit afraid of the unknown, but uh, getting buy-in from everybody and everybody on the team to really work together is a big piece. Uh, we struggle still today with the definition of a task, how we figure out what a task is. You know, when you're developing, you have your user story, you know, very specifically what you want to do. In our world, we don't necessarily have that. Um, since we're not a strictly development shop. And so kind of defining a task and how that fits. Um, we also have tried to, uh, again, alluding to that, using a tool that really is a development type tool, fits really well for development in our non-development world that we are. And so um, it, it makes a lot of sense when you look at it from building a piece of software, but maybe not so much for other things. And um, we also struggle with true uh, time estimation. Um, we work on that a little bit, but since we do it on post-it notes and things, we don't actually then take that information anywhere. Uh, we still struggle with that a little bit. And then, like I said, those meteors, those things that kind of come in and hit us out of the blue that we have to deal with and that interrupt all the work that we have planned. So um, kind of to wrap it up from Des Moines, we, we do have future plans and things we'd like to do. And a lot of them are to try to solve some of those issues. So we would like to get electronic. We'd like an electronic sprint board or a piece of software that can help us um, improve our time estimation, get that history, track the details of the work that we've done, uh, do burn downs and some analysis and, and kind of help us organize a little bit better. Um, that's where we'd like to go. That's um, on the horizon. It's kind of when we have time and when we can fit it into our sprints and do work. So um, with that, I will wrap up my part and stop sharing.
Thanks. Over to Karen. Over to Kamran. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Let me know when you can. Are you clicking the green? Oh, there, there it goes. There it goes. All right. Uh, so I'm Kamran Karimi. I'm the IT Division Manager for Enterprise Applications and Data Services at the City of Austin. Um, so we started our journey about four years ago, and so I'll kind of be mixing some of my numbers. Uh, so first of all, what my team does, we are the, uh, we support the enterprise commercial off-the-shelf systems for the City of Austin. So we've defined what we call some of our essential capabilities. So we have uh, systems around case management, asset management, business intelligence, document management, uh, my team supports the city's enterprise service bus, databases. Um, so within my division today, we have about 30 uh, full-time employees augmented by about 15 contractors and temps. And I have the contractors and temps in italics because that number has grown since we started uh, this journey. And the reason for that is because we've been successful. People have been willing to pony up money to get us those resources to carry forward. Um, we have essentially three different ways that work comes into our areas. And the first is we have an IT governance cycle, which annually aligns with the budget process. So every department comes in with their business needs, asking for money to get their projects done. And typically only about less than 10% of the projects get approved. So about four years ago, um, with the number of people that I had in my division, we had about 25 projects, large projects uh, that we were working on. And since a lot of those needs from the departments weren't being met, what people would do is they break up those larger needs into an enhancement request and they would submit them as help desk tickets for enhancements. And, and at any given point in time, we probably had about 100 to 150 tickets in our queue. And the problem with that is there's no value assigned to those enhancement requests. There's no priority assigned to them. It's just work on these 100 things all at once. So how do you make the determination of what you should focus your time on? Um, and the last thing is that the team also does operational break fix work. Break fix work. Um, we have about 50 to 60 tickets in our queue for that, and that always takes priority because something's not working. Um, so obviously with that workload divided by the number of people we had, things were not getting done. So what do our customers think of that? Well, everybody is pretty upset. Lots of work, lots of need, but not enough uh, work was happening. To, to accomplish uh, some goals and, and to meet their needs. So they were unhappy. And what was the IT team thinking? Well, the exact same thing. They were unhappy because they were working really hard, doing lots of, putting forth lots of effort, but nothing was actually getting accomplished and they were getting fingers pointed at them uh, for not getting things done. So things were pretty bleak about four years ago. Uh, and so the team that I'm kind of going to focus on with the rest of the story, uh, there was a team of about six people supporting our case management system. We had one contractor as well. So a total of about seven people um, trying to split up load between large projects, enhancement requests, and operational break fixes. Uh, so what we decided to do was to do a pilot with Agile Scrum uh, to really focus on those enhancement requests because that was the biggest pain point for our customers were those you know, small to medium enhancements to the system. And so what we did was we took three different departments and we did a round robin between them of two week sprints. So it was two weeks with department A, two weeks with department B, two weeks with department uh, C, and then uh, rinse and repeat over again. Uh, we went out and got certified Scrum Master training for everybody on the team to make them um, aware of, of Scrum. Uh, we brought the product owners in as well because their role was just as important as the technical team and Scrum Master to understand what we're trying to do. Uh, but we weren't implementing what I would call pure Scrum. Um, we were just taking the things out of our ticketing system, those enhancement requests, and using those as uh, the things that we we're going to work on during the sprint. So we weren't doing user stories. The staff was not 100% dedicated. So we had a small team, like maybe three people working on this sprint. Uh, they might be, depending on the, the workload, maybe 25 to 50% any given sprint uh, dedicated to, to the work. And then the roles were kind of blurred. Because we had such a small team, the scrum master was also kind of a technical person. Uh, so they might pitch in and help out there. Or the product owner might be pitching in and doing some technical work as well. So it certainly wasn't an ideal, pure form of Agile Scrum. But what we found was it kind of worked. And it wasn't perfect. It wasn't ideal. But it worked well enough that we would consider it a success. And so at the end of about three or four months, we kind of did a larger retrospective with the people that were involved in these sprints and the customers uh, to find out what they thought of it. 
And some of the feedback that we got was they liked it because they were able to focus our efforts on the highest value items and start to deliver on those right away. Uh, we discovered and clarified requirements sooner rather than later. Typically it was things getting passed back and forth uh, over the wall. It might take a, a month to understand a requirement, whereas now it would take a few days. Uh, the fact that there were daily scrums put pressure on team members to deliver, so results were actually happening. Uh, but most importantly, the, the people on the team um, felt that the fact that they had autonomy in determining what the solution might be gave them a huge morale boost. And for the first time, there was kind of this breakdown, us versus them mentality. Uh, people suddenly from the product owner side, the technical side, came together kind of as one team to, to accomplish things. Uh, and one of the best things that we heard was we've gotten more done in the last three months than we have in the last three years. And so this was that initial success that led to trust and willingness to invest in, in doing more of this. So about three years ago, we were going through a major system upgrade. And this was kind of a traditional PMBOK project with all the artifacts you might expect uh, out of a PMI-led project. Um, one of the, but we did have a project manager who was very interested in Agile, and so she was willing to kind of bend and be flexible in the way we approached this particular project. And one of the things that we had was 700 reports that needed to be converted from the old system over to or the old version to the new version. Uh, and so we did. We took those, uh, worked with the departments to identify which reports were the priority and we knocked them out in two week sprints. So at the end of those two weeks, uh, the reports were migrated, tested, and ready to be rolled out to production uh, right away. We also rolled out the upgrade incrementally to departments. So we would start off with the power users within a particular department. Uh, they would test it and give us feedback. Then we would move on to uh, groups within the department and get them to test it and uh, approve it. And then we finally would roll it out department wide and then once they were okay and stable, we moved on to the next department and went through that same cycle over and over. And what we found was by taking this approach, um, we were closing that feedback loop, getting information back to us sooner rather than later. And with each power user group, with each department, it became more and more successful and much more smooth in terms of the rollout. Um, and also we have a governing board over our capabilities. And in this case, the board was empowered to adjust the scope on the fly, reallocate funds, and so what was originally in the charter didn't become what we delivered. There were a lot of things that, we, that uh, as we got into it, the, the board decided, well, that particular requirement isn't really that important. So we don't need that in the scope of this project. And they were empowered to make those types of changes. Um, since then, uh, in the last probably year and a half, what we've done is we've taken Agile from the team level up to the program level. Uh, so we've scaled it. Uh, we split the implementations and operations into different groups. Uh, the implementation team kind of focusing on Agile Scrum, the operations team using Kanban. Uh, we've built out this model to other capabilities like our asset management team. We're using it some, to some degree with business intelligence. We've started to implement a DevOps tool set. And the dream someday would be to scale this to, por to the portfolio. I don't know if that's wishful thinking or not, but that's where we'd like to head someday. But, you know, it started off with this small pilot uh, that planted the seed we had some success and got buy-in from customers going forward to try out and expand it a little bit more uh, with each iteration. So that is the end of my presentation. And uh, here's my contact information if anybody wants to, uh, to send me an email. Thank so you. I will uh, stop sharing my screen here. And we'll pass it over to Amy. All right. Okay. Are you able to see my presentation? Okay, great. Well, this is going to be a bit short and sweet. Um, I have not had the privilege of really implementing, but I've been a benefactor of implementations of Agile and um, various versions of it. Uh, I'm with the city of Dallas. I'm a senior GIS analyst. Uh, I work under the stormwater department. We're a very small team, uh, about five people. We work within a very large city uh, government framework. Um, most of our work is reactive. Uh, we support a homegrown application that basically uh, likes to break. So uh, it's not something we really can plan, um, but uh, it impacts our, 
our daily work for things that we uh, do plan for, like new, techno new technology initiatives. Um, so in order to accommodate both that reactionary workload as well as our, our ongoing projects, we've uh, basically taken Kanban and Agile and kind of mushed them together. Uh, the Kanban is really great for uh, dealing with all of the uh, reactionary work uh, and making sure that we don't have too much on our plate. Um, the Agile is great because uh, we use our daily stand-ups to not only make sure that our, um, our help tickets, you might say, get done properly, but also to um, then use that part of, of, of Agile where we create epics and um, basically merged to the two together by using an application called Trello. Uh, and this is just a quick screenshot of Trello. Um, we use it both, like I said, for Kanban and kind of the, the mix up or mash up of, of Agile. Um, as you can see, we have epics, uh, what we call ongoing, and then basically our to do next, which is more of the reactionary type uh, work that we get. So we'll get an email. Um, something's not working. We put it into do next. Everybody sees it. And, and that kind of satisfies that uh, the Kanban slash got to get it done aspect. And then on the left, our epics are just kind of more of the, the agile framework where we use them um, to basically have a, a checklist of what might be considered as stories and tasks. And then we're able to break these out into separate um, tasks on the to do next board. Uh, it's really nice because, uh, you know, one of the things I think that is great about Agile and in all versions of it is that it provides a transparency um, for the employees, the management and for the uh, product owners. Uh, because, like, let's say, for instance, you know, we were really, really busy. My boss gets a call from his boss. Hey, you know, we need this done ASAP. It's very easy to pull up, in our case, the Trello board and say, look, this is all we have going on here. What needs to be put in the back burner in order to satisfy your needs? Um, and, and I think, you know, agile and iterations and, and getting things to the, the, uh, the owners, that's, that's one of the biggest benefits of it is that you're able to um, allow your your end users to uh, communicate with you. And I think communication is a, is a big um, reason why this type of workflow works. So the benefits of ours, like I said, it's, it's communication, um, not only between your stakeholders, but also uh, for employees. You know, your daily standup is a great way for us to have permission to talk to um, our coworkers regarding work and also to our management uh, staff. Um, it is very good to uh, explain responsibility of what tasks uh, are uh, assigned to who, who is responsible for it, who has gotten things done, who hasn't gotten things done. Uh, the transparency part of it where you, everybody knows what's going on. Everybody realizes that if you can't get something done, uh, there's a reason why. And also because if you want something done, then we've got to know what the priorities are. And equity, I think it, it's, it's really helpful, especially as an employee who benefits from this. Um, it's very easy to see when you're using, uh, you know, Agile or like our scrappy version of it, uh, where the workload is and um, it, it makes the morale uh, much higher. Uh, and also you, you tend to get more stuff done. So as you can see, I have my contact information here on the the side, um, but really that's, you know, that's all I have. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Amy. And thanks everyone. That was a lot of great information for how you're using Agile and will be great context going into this next part of the conversation. So I'm going to pass to Melinda, who is going to moderate the questions from here. Thanks, Elizabeth. Can you hear me fine? Yep. Great. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Melinda Burgess and I am uh, the Director of Community Engagement for AGL. And we're just going to dig in a bit more on these presentations by starting with some questions for our panelists. Do keep the questions coming in the chat, those are awesome. And the panelists can get to them as they have time. 
Um, so for you panelists, just dive into any of these questions that are relative to you. Um, a lot of you have talked about keeping some parts of Agile and adapting others. How did you decide which parts you were going to incorporate and which you wouldn't do? Did you have a process for finding those parts that worked for you and how did you know that it was working? I'll start um, and Erin can always add on to the story, but I think out of that starter kit that we looked at, we actually tried each one of those or at least did like a little bit of a, a tutorial on what each of those items would be. And I think as a group, we, we found that the transparency or making the work visible was the highest value for us. As Erin mentioned, the the catalyst for us was when we were understaffed. We, we lost a staff member in, in this interim where we were trying to get as much done as possible um, while preparing to hire somebody new. It was a cultural shift for us and we really had to make the work visible. So that's why the progress board is kind of the primary piece for our Agile today. And, and for us at the city of Austin, I, I don't think it was, there was any methodology applied to what we decided to do or not do. Uh, it was just trying to adhere as much as possible to the agile principles, not try to focus on the scrum framework to say, this is the way you should do certain things. You know, like I said, you know, typically in scrum, they say a team should be between five to nine people. Well, I didn't have five to nine people that I could dedicate to a particular sprint. Doesn't mean you can't take some of the principles of Agile and start to apply them to, to, to smaller teams. Uh, the downside was that we had, like I said, people that had to uh, work in dual, dual roles. So it wasn't ideal, but it was better than where we were at because it led to better um, collaboration between the IT side of the house and the business side of the house. So we certainly saw advantages to what we were doing, even though it wasn't perfect. Um, so, you know, my advice would be, just take whatever you can from Agile um, and don't try to worry about being a, a pure Agilist in that sense. Um, just take whatever works for you. Um, we actually did not implement the, um, the sprint reviews and we really don't have sprints. And the reason why we chose not to use that part of it was because like I said, a lot of our work is, is support, it's reactionary. And we found that for our main projects or epics that we did have, uh, we were able to use our daily standup uh, as a, a way to keep in touch with how those were going. Uh, we call it a sidebar. So we have our daily standup and then we kind of have maybe, uh, if anybody has anything to say regarding major projects, Products, uh, projects, uh, you know, I mean, good, bad, and ugly. Thanks, Amy. Erin, um, did you have anything to add, or we want to? Well, I, you know, I kind of reiterate what everybody else said. It's, it's pick and choose the pieces that work for you and your team, and it's, it's an iterative process. You know, we've tried some things and they worked, and we tried other things and they didn't, and we built on the ones that did, and we're very much not pure at all and, and we use the pieces that we need and that, that the team really kind of gravitates towards it's very team driven and, and we make decisions based on what the team wants to do with it and how we want it to grow so yep. so basically deciding on your agile process was an agile process exactly. <laughs> iterate uh, upon to make your agile work for you awesome um let's talk about the spreading of agile uh have any of you seen other teams or departments in your organization adopting agile after seeing your success or bits of agile or even outside your organization have you uh, seen this idea grow from things that you've said or uh, by your example so I do have one example, um, and I see uh, somebody in the chat window has asked a question about applying Agile to areas outside of IT uh, to, to, to business processes, for example. Um, one of the departments that we worked with early on uh, doing the sprints, um, you know, they create a backlog for us to work uh, in terms of the IT enhancements that need to be done. But they internally have taken and developed a backlog of their own which is not always IT related needs. It's just kind of a, there's an issue with the business process that needs to be fixed. 
And this internal backlog that this department has, they kind of peel some of it off and it goes into our IT backlog. Some of it could be uh, you know, a business process improvement they work through in sprints to, to make improvements. So you know, Agile, even though it might have come from the IT world, is definitely something that doesn't have to be limited to just that. I've seen within our organization, people taking those Agile concepts and using the Agile framework to attack business problems as well that have nothing to do with IT. I can speak to that a little bit too. Um, I showed a slide of our giant sprint board that we've got up and it takes up an entire wall um, in our kind of what we call the GIS lounge. It's our collaborative work area. And um, it's up there, it's big, it's bold, and people come in and say, what in the heck is that? And we can, staff can say, that is what we are working on for you. You know, these are all the things right here we're doing this sprint in the next two weeks. And uh, when we have our meeting or discussion about what we're doing for them, we say, okay, we're gonna fit you into two and four weeks. And this is how it, it kind of works into our schedule. And people get that. They can see that. They can see what we're working on. And they can understand kind of what we're working through. And um, it's a way to, to not necessarily say no, but to say, we'll get to it. And we can work you in. And here's how it's going to fit with us. And then a lot of our other divisions come back. And um, our, our web dev team is actually doing some work. And they have their own sprints that they work on. Um, but other groups are kind of curious about how we're doing things have come in and ask questions and we show them and walk them through the process and they're taking it back and evaluating it. I think it's, it's growing a little bit at a time. So it's, it's been good. And, and having that board right there really makes it obvious. And part of our hesitation in going electronic and putting it in Trello or somewhere is we would lose all those post-its that everybody really likes to see every day when they, they come and go out of the office. So. What about you, Amy, from the non-management perspective? Have you had a chance to evangelize or spread Agile um, in your department? Um, not necessarily at the city of Dallas. Uh, we, we have been trying, you know, both, both myself and my, my manager saying, hey, look at Trello and, uh, you know, Agile and Sprints because there's a lot of, you know, Dallas is a large old, uh, enterprise and there's a lot of bureaucratic red tape. Um, so it has been mentioned, but it has not been, um, the disease has not spread, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, I do know that uh, there have been other uh, uh, organizations that have looked at things that are similar to Agile where, you know, to me, Agile is a, is a, is a it's a community project. It's a community workflow where everybody is involved from the, the top to the bottom um, and things like uh, using lean coffee and things like that where everybody has a chance to be part of the conversation. Um, you know, I have seen people pick up that part of where the everybody is involved in the workflow, um, but, uh, you know, still trying to get the word out. <laughs> right. Well, I saw a audience question about estimation and Erin, you touched on it a bit when you talked about your sticky notes, but you have your work out there for people to see what you're doing for them. But, um, and I think it was also addressed in one of these talks, but does anyone want to build on the idea of um, doing estimation type stuff and prioritization type stuff in the scrappy agile uh, that you've implemented? It may not be 100% kosher as by the book. Um, but how do you manage customer uh, needs and even more tricky customer expectations? One of the things we did with our parks department is actually give them their own backlog. So they had some curiosity about what we were doing for Agile, what, what was it, and why did we keep telling them we'll get to you in four weeks, we'll get to you in six weeks. They come in with a new request and we'd say, well, what gets bumped off of the, the current sprint in order for us to do this for you? And I think it's given, um, given us a new way to talk with our customers, even if they're not themselves doing agile, but they, they get a little special treatment um, and have sort of their own backlog that we use our, our business analysts to kind of remind them of what's on that backlog on a regular basis. So anytime something new comes in, it's visible to them. Yeah. 
Letting people know what you're working on is always helpful. Anybody else want to speak to that or are we ready for the next? So I've seen quite a bit of back and forth uh, online and elsewhere where folks debated whether it's uh, even okay or effective uh, to use alternative versions of Agile, like the purists, I suppose. Um, you've seen it work uh, in your organizations, of course. Have you faced any criticism or any type of pushback in, um, in Agile communities or in, from anywhere uh, about the way you're doing things, that it's uh, maybe not kosher enough or proper? I could say that kind of internally, we initially pushed back on ourselves because we read it and we're trying to learn about it and explore it. And we're like, well, this, this is development. This is a tool for developers. How is this going to work with all the myriad of tasks that we have and the, the wide variety of projects we're all working on at any given time? And, and kind of coming to turn, terms with that and really understanding how to break down anything, any project, anything you do on a daily basis, even your day-to-day, week-to-week tasks you know you're going to do, um, and, and make the framework work for that was kind of our initial challenge. Um, everybody we've talked to about it and kind of explained how we're doing it differently actually really like it and um, say, hey, I could use that at home with my home projects, right? And so, um, and I think Anna's even tried to use it on her kids a couple of times. So it, you know, it, it's a, uh, it, it, the hardest part is winning over minds and, and people's kind of fear of change, really, and, and from my experience, anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, another thing I was hoping we could discuss today is um, an aha moment when you knew that you were headed down the right track, um, especially maybe early on when you were just trying things experimentally. Um, was there a moment where something went the direction it was supposed to and you knew you were headed the right way, uh, even though you may not have been doing Agile the way some of the books say? Um, for me, uh, as I mentioned that pilot uh, that we did with some of the departments early on, um, as a resource manager, I was, you know, I, I have no place being in a sprint session, uh, but I was just kind of a fly on the wall. People would ask me questions and I would just shrug my shoulders and say, you know, I'm, I'm just here to observe, don't ask me questions. Um, but in the very first uh, scrum, daily scrum call that we had, there was an issue with a misunderstanding about one of the requirements that from the business. And I was just like smiling uh, ear to ear. I thought I was so excited to hear that there was an issue, understanding a requirement. And uh, one of the people on the technical team came into my office afterwards and said, why, why were you so happy? I mean, this just shows that the business units, they don't understand the requirements they bring to us. They don't bring to us clear requirements. And I said, I know, but typically we would not find this out until a month. We found this out on the very first day. And now this person's going back to some of the end users and getting clarification. Tomorrow they're going to bring back an answer. So we just closed that gap by almost an entire month. Like this is exactly what's supposed to be happening. Uh, and going forward over time, after doing many, many sprints, um, the product owner became much better at understanding the business and understanding what needed to be brought to the table from the business side so the technical team understood what they were supposed to be delivering. Great. Any other aha moments? Well, I just have a story to tell. Um, I work worked for uh, a, a great supervisor and I worked there for years and we did not have Agile. Well, I left, went on, came back as a temp and they had implemented Agile. Now, I don't know if they were a purist or not, but it was like night and day because when I worked there, everything was like, this is the number one priority. Everybody's freaking out. And when I got there, he had actually trained the other departments to know that if we're on a sprint, sorry, you got to wait until next time. Because a lot of times what would happen is if somebody's like, we have a meeting, we need this in 30 minutes. But they knew about the meeting three weeks beforehand. So it was just night and day how um, it was like, wow, this is working the way it's supposed to be, to be able to make sure that we can get our projects done with priorities and keep our, you know, uh, uh, stress level down. So that wasn't, that was just amazing. <laughs> That's wonderful. Great balanced approach. 
Um, so let's talk about culture change. Um, it's been addressed a bit in the presentations, but we all know or have heard that culture change is the hardest part of Agile, especially in government. Um, what were some key steps you took to get that culture integrated and how did you get buy-in from those that might have resisted uh, some of the processes and the culture of Agile? Well, as I mentioned in my slides, um, we kind of did some research, real basic kind of looking into what is Scrum, what, what is Agile, and then had an honest conversation about what the fit would be. Would this work? And what do we like or don't like about um, how we're operating at that time? So the, those sort of team environment issues that I, I mentioned were what came out of some conversations between me as manager and our analyst. So it, it gave us a um, insight into what we really wanted to solve was a communication problem or a, a collaboration problem or lack of collaboration. Um, but I think that brought focus to it when we had a a person leave the organization and we were sort of forced into trying to to get more done with fewer resources that transparency became essential and I'm glad we did it at that time because when we did hire somebody new we could bring them right into that culture that we wanted to create and it was an excellent fit. In the hiring process, we could look for somebody that would fit into that. And now we've done that twice and had two very successful hires into that culture. And so Aaron's group is full steam ahead and Agile is a, a mainstay of how they get their work done. And I, I think for me, um, it's trying to identify who the influence, influencers are within your organization or who are the people who are already uh, of a like mind in terms of adopting Agile and who will be your evangelist going forward. Um, I kind of showed the quote earlier on in my presentation about the person who said, um, we've accomplished more in the last three months than we have in the last three years. That particular person was probably one of our most vocal critics in terms of IT service delivery and meeting needs in a timely fashion. So getting some successes early on with that person uh, who was very vocal was a huge win for us. And that's part of the reason we were able to take it, um, take it forward in terms of that culture change. And so it's been very much a, a bottom up change rather than a top down approach to uh, changing the culture here. And uh, one of our audience members has a similar question, not about culture directly, but sort of culture process. And that is uh, the balance of uh, tracking time as in an asset management program, um, balancing with implementing Agile. Um, and has anyone had experience with something like that, the overlap of time tracking versus Agile? We do time tracking and Agile both in a pretty loose sense. So um, everybody is uh, expected to at least identify which department they're doing work for. Those habits were kind of already in place before we started doing Agile. Um, it, perhaps that's one of the things that makes it tricky to do a, a very exact estimation um, because we, we know we have to report that um, in our time tracking anyway. Uh, I don't think we've attempted to kind of compare the two and take our time tracking data and look back at here's what we were doing in our sprint and how much time did that actually take. That's one of the disadvantages I think of our kind of sticky note system. Very good. 
Um, so about Agile and the fear of failure, a lot of people realize that, um, you know, you have to be more willing to embrace risk uh, in a smart way. Um, I was wondering if any of you have a story about a time that uh, you failed, whether at implementing one of these processes or in a project and had to iterate quickly, um, get to something new quickly, and what tricks would you recommend for overcoming the fear of failure inside of an organization where that is often um, you know, something you would avoid at all costs. I can speak to it a little bit, uh, kind of the, the second path part especially. Um, we're, we're a small group and, and failure is hard uh, because we're expected to, to do it and get it done and move on to the next uh, issue or project. And, and I think what we found is that um, with, with our group, we, we can't be afraid to fail failure happens, it's never ever a complete failure. And we actually try to spin it internally with our group to say, well, did we really fail? Did we learn you know, how to build the right light bulb, right? So for us, even just the process of getting to where we are with our sprint board and our tasks and our task planning, you know, some weeks, every week we fail at our sprint. We never get everything done. We still have tasks that are in the, the plans phase because we overestimate, we, we think we can do things that we can't. Um, and, and I think within our group, we accept that and we know we try to improve each week. We do um, every few months, we actually do a sprint review. We don't do it each sprint. Um, and we kind of kick back and, and see what we can do to do better and, and what works and what doesn't. And then also we, we build a tool. We work with our partners on it. We build it, we iterate, we do a prototype. We always fail. I mean, that's, that's just life. And, and at the end of the day, our, our customers are happy because we're, we're doing stuff and we're getting it done. And, we just try to understand that it's okay if it doesn't work. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. Failing forward. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? Um, well, I guess I don't really see them as failures because as long as everybody... understands that uh, you know and the product owners on board and knows that okay here we need you to look at this and tell us if it's okay and you you have them involved then you know it it is okay it's it's more of uh, you know a revision is necessary than necessarily a failure. <laughs> I feel like fail is sometimes just a it is a sensation word that's that's tossed around in the agile community a lot but it, it makes a good headline. <laughs> Um, you know, we touched on this a bit as we're getting closer to the end of our discussion. Um, I did hear some of this from Aaron in his presentation, but I would like to hear from the rest of you regarding any future plans. Um, as far as is there value in keeping Agile scrappy and, and small, or do you want to expand into safe DevOps, any more formal Agile practices? Um, so what's the what's next on your horizon and what do you plan to just keep as is and is working just fine for you right now? Well, I think for us, um, I kind of touched on in our presentation that we started off with scrappy agile, which was great. There was benefit to it and we certainly saw value in it. Um, but we had kind of reached the point where we're ready to take it to the next level and that was expanded up to the program level one of the things that we found was doing these sprints, we were able to accomplish um, quite a bit. And so we were you know, letting water out of the bottom of that bucket at a faster rate. The problem was the demand was still coming in um, faster than we could address it. So we at that point really felt like we needed to expand Agile to the program level. Um, as I mentioned, we had a governing board over these enterprise systems. Uh, that governing board is made up of one representative from each department. Um, and so we sat down and said, look, we're having successes delivering value faster, but we need to meet with you. You all are have, having a common understanding about uh, this demand management. And so we put in together, uh, put together a, a plan where basically each department would submit kind of their top two needs every three months. And so we were doing these three month program increments where we would take those needs, determine which ones have the highest value, uh, and then make a commitment over that three months. We're going to do X number of sprints to get these things done in the next three months. And so it kind of changed the way we approach some of the larger projects. We're taking these huge multi-year projects and breaking them down into something that can be accomplished in three months. 
um, and uh, delivering on those. And so that was kind of a huge step forward for us. And so that, we started doing that about a year and a half ago. We're still improving on that, um, but it's been successful so far. Great. Anyone else want to touch on future plans quickly? I think just continuing to work with our customers so they understand it. Um, probably sometime in this sometime this year, we will do a presentation to our department directors and city manager's office, um, just letting them know about this different kind of work that we're doing or a different way of working and see what that opens up for us. At least we have a different way of communicating with our user departments. And I, I think of Agile as primary of, primarily of vocabulary that you um, can, can use and communicate about expectations um, and accomplishments. Definitely. Well, with our last few minutes, I would love to get uh, the, the one-liner from each of you on and what's the best advice you could offer to local governments or small teams hoping to implement Agile? Are there magic words that you would say to uh, get people to try it if they're just on the fence and they're just not sure? I think if you're doing Agile in a way that looks different from everybody else, then you're doing it right. You have to, to be Agile um, by doing Agile not something you can study and research and wait for the, the perfect um, kind of implementation. Just get started with something really simple. Uh, in my case, I started with a personal Kanban and got comfortable with that. And as Erin mentioned, I did experiment on my family too. Um, I think I would let the person know that not to expect their first iteration or their first um, application of, of Agile to necessarily work. It's, it's, a, it's a work in progress <laughs> and that, you know, every team is different, every um, organization is different and that you're gonna, you're gonna take pieces from it that, you, that are working for you and kind of make it your own. So, uh, I, go ahead. Uh, I would agree with all that too. I, I think that, you know, it's everybody does it differently. And the, the big takeaway I have is don't get bogged down in the details, you know, go, go get the scrum master training and then come back and make it, make it what you need and what, what your team wants it to be. And, you know, that, that team ownership aspect I think is big and self-organizing. That's a big key to it. And you self-organized how you're going to approach it as well. So that'd be my takeaway too. And I would say don't try to change the organization. If you're going to change the organization as a whole overnight, uh, any win, no matter how small, is still a win. So just get those small wins and iterate, and bigger things will come. Awesome. Thank you so much for those responses, and thank you so much for being here today, panelists, to talk to us about this. Um, I wanted to let you all know that our panelists have generously offered to share their emails, so I have posted those in the chat if they didn't get to your question and you want to get in touch or follow up with anything. Um, I'll also post a few ways you can keep in touch with AGL on Twitter and LinkedIn and our website, and those are all places that you can find this recording as soon as we get it ready. There are those. And that wraps today. Thank you so much for coming to AGL Live, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye.